Hello, and welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and we're here to kick off the holiday season from Museum Mile in Manhattan. Our first story takes us here, to El Museo del Barrio. The oldest museum in the United States dedicated to Latino art, El Museo has been passed over by time and controversy. But we explored a brand new exhibit, which hopes to bring El Museo back to its glory days. What's so interesting about sculpture? Well, I, I like that I can do all this physical work like carpentry, because painting is very mental. Mm -hmm. That's Marisol Escobar, whose work is the subject of a new exhibition at El Museo del Barrio, her first solo exhibit in a New York museum showcasing her lengthy and varied career. She was important in New York City. She was, you know, around at a time with other pop artists, male artists, who of course enjoyed tremendous renown. And uh, in her time, she as well, you know, enjoyed this renown. Marisol, as she's known, came to prominence in the late 50s and early 60s when the pop art movement was in full swing and she could be seen everywhere. Marisol was in the thick of it, standing side by side with the most recognizable symbol of pop art. Marisol Escobar, mm -hmm. right, 84 years old now. Mm -hmm. Uh, very, an unbelievable artist. I mean, her work, just walking through some of this with you uh, is yes. something to see. Explain a little bit the meaning behind having her uh, works exhibited here. It's really significant in a number of ways. We're going to pay attention to women artists, mm -hmm. those that have been neglected especially, who merit, you know, museum retrospective or surveys. And so Marisol will be the first in a series of exhibitions devoted to women artists. Daniel Veneciano became executive director of El Museo this past March, its third in the span of three years. Even though the museum had gone through a substantial renovation in 2008, he inherited a museum in crisis which was poorly staffed and in financial straits. Were you seeing the problems that had been going through through the years and were you thinking, gosh, if I were there, this is what I might do? or? Was it something that was sort of tugging at the heartstrings a little bit? At, you know, it's a shame that a museum could be let go. Yes, we all read, you know, the Times right. and um, the, the news about El Museo. Um, and I did feel bad about it. And so I didn't think of exactly, you know, what I would do if I were there. But I knew that I would love to help given the opportunity. Now that you are here, what are your plans? I actually don't want to return to some, you know, former days of glory, but really think about the new challenges, bringing something new and different to El Museo. I think that moments of crisis uh, should be taken advantage of, mm -hmm. that they can become the moment when you can reinvent an institution and invent it in ways that make it newer and more vibrant than before. In the spirit of reinvention, El Museo is not just focusing on Latin American female artists, but is also crossing over to architecture, fashion, and the performing arts. But it all starts with Marisol. This is actually a, a bronze cast of a piece she created on Picasso. And one of the things you'll see with um, the face and some of the features is that even though her work tends to be kind of rough hewn, yeah. She always seems to capture something essential about her subject. And so you see, it's clearly Picasso. It's clearly Picasso. Marisol's eye seems to enhance scenes that we're all familiar with. The funny thing is that in pop art, it's not supposed to be so unique, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it recycles popular imagery. And what she does, I think, is bring something of herself she makes it a little more personal in her response to images from popular culture. And in that sense, she really stretches the, the idea of pop art. And this is very recognizable here, the funeral. Uh, this is based on that iconic photograph of the John funeral Kennedy procession Jr. with John Kennedy Jr. saluting as his father's casket rolls mm. by. And you see the, the look of bewilderment and distress mm -hmm. in the little boy's face. Daniel Veneciano believes that the Marisol exhibition will breathe the kind of life into a museum that was nearly forgotten. We have a five-year plan mm -hmm. and there will be one female exhibition um, retrospective in each of, the, uh, each of the five years. And the next one will be um, Rodriguez Calero, who is a New Yorican artist. 
and um, that will open in June. There is an interest in bringing you know, Latino art to different parts of the city. I think you know, one of the things that strikes me about this, coming to this museum is the passion that people have who work here, who are associated with it, who want to be associated with it. I've worked in a number of institutions, you know, Los An New York before, LA, Lincoln, Nebraska. I've never seen uh, people so passionate, truly, um, about an institution. I don't know if it's a Latino thing, but, but it works. And to me, that's impressive, and I think um, about the special identity that this museum has. Marisol's works will be on display through January 10th. A musical instrument is the vital link between an artist and their music. Tina Beth Pina has more on that unique relationship. The one constant that a musician should never have to worry about is the string itself. It's really what, what brings the instrument alive. My name is John Dadari III. We come from a long legacy of string manufacturers. In fact, I represent the ninth generation of string manufacturing in our family's history. Um, it goes back to uh, the 17th century to uh, Sale, Italy, where my family was originally from. My uh, great-grandfather, uh, Charles Dario, immigrated to the U.S. really primarily to um, create some revenue and to send money back home to support the family. He began importing strings from our uh, family in, in Sale. Um, and he did that for a number of years, um, literally distributing out of his home, uh, you know, in Astoria, Queens. It got to a point, though, where during World War I, um, it was very difficult for him to import strings because of certain trade embargoes that were happening at the time. So it kind of forced his hand to get back into string manufacturing and do it himself. Uh, and with the support of some other family, he was able to get up and running uh, in his own garage. His only son, John Daddario Sr., was my grandfather and he uh, did tons of research and to this day he's responsible for a lot of the breakthroughs in string manufacturing that are the standard today, whether it be a process or the actual raw materials. Where did that process evolve to where it became the standard for, for music, for, for rock and roll from the 50s on up? My uh, grandfather uh, and my, my uncle and father, they developed this round-wound string over the years, which, uh, be, which obviously gave you the advantage of much more, uh, much brighter sound, a different tone that, that was unique at the time, and became a standard, essentially, for most electric guitar strings today. What my grandfather, he wasn't really a musician himself. What he relied on are close friendships with, uh, with musicians. So he was a good listener and uh, of course engineer a product that over the course of time became the standard. Over the years his, the business evolved and uh, they did a lot of creative things and, and you know, we innovated with materials, we innovated with equipment, we innovated with processes and we ended up uh, being the leading manufacturer of strings over the years uh, uh, in the world and today we are the largest. We actually own and operate two of our own wire mills, one of which is uh, right across the street from our string manufacturing facility where we manufacture the most critical raw material in string manufacturing, which is high carbon steel music wire. We make two different shapes. We make hexagonal shape wire, which is the core for our wound strings. Uh, and we make round wire, which is just your standard plain steel string. We have three main steps. First step is to draw it. So we start at a larger diameter and draw it down to the final size and shape that we need. Uh, the second step, because we can't make it straight, we have to put it through a, a two-axis straightener where we take the ring cast out and any side-to-side -side sweep. Uh, and then after that, it's either finished and ready to be wound on or have a tin coating put on it. There's a lot of science in the engineering of these strings, so uh, it requires a lot of training and equipment that essentially is designed to eliminate all the variables that, that we can. So you're manufacturing those strings in a control process and you're minimizing uh, variables throughout the manufacturing process. We're manufacturing in this facility uh, 700,000 strings a day on average. 
majority of which are fret and instrument strings. Strings for guitar, electric bass, classical guitar, ukulele, banjo, mandolin. The smaller portion of the business is orchestral strings, strings for violin, viola, cello, and bass. And the work cells are dedicated to specific types of strings. I work in the violin cello string making department. This is the machine I use to make them. Since I am a musician, I don't see this as a job. I see this as a making music. The beginning start of making music. Music starts here. Before you started working here, did you know about all the work it took to make strings? No. I had no idea. I've been a musician for 11 years, and I didn't know. I didn't know how a string was made. I only knew how to play music, how a guitar sounded. It's a lot of steps that um, people don't know. It's not just two wires put together and it sounds. There's a lot of steps to it and a lot of work you know, involved into it. From planning, from designing all the way down to a finished product, it's a lot of work. See, I'm really proud of the product we make it. Well, if somebody's playing the strings, that means I build it or we build it. Strings, of course, uh, to this day is uh, uh, the, the crux of the business. Every accessory that we manufacture is essentially uh, the, the, the link to the musician and their instrument. What do you think your great-grandfather would say if you look at the business right now? He would be absolutely amazed at um, what's been accomplished, but also equally amazed at how complex and uh, competitive it is these days. And for me, it's a privilege to work in, this, in the family business. We're constantly innovating, and we're looking to uh, invest in uh, research into new raw materials that can become a breakthrough product for a musician. We're constantly striving for that, and uh, we'll move on. One of New York's holiday staples is George Balanchine's The Nutcracker, celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. Carol Ann Riddell visited the School of American Ballet to see how its youngest stars are preparing for the big stage. George Balanchine's The Nutcracker, it is a treasured holiday tradition, but the onstage magic is months in the making. Dozens of children spend long hours preparing for what feels like a dream come true. They are graceful, poised, and diligent beyond their young years. Meet the dancers in the Nutcracker at the New York City Ballet. There are 126 children in this year's production, all of them from the School of American Ballet. And though the thrill is immense for these youngsters, so is the workload. Dina Abergel is a former dancer with the New York City Ballet and now the children's ballet master there. They do have to be incredibly dedicated, though, these children. They're not sort of just typical. No, they're not typical in any kids. way. Because you have to be able to balance, at such a young age, a schedule that's, that's really very mature. Because it's not like they can just not do their homework. They have to go to school all day, come here for class, have dinner somewhere in between, go to rehearsal, go home, and do their homework, and get up and do the whole thing over and over. But the truth is, is that they have to be very focused in order to make it work. And they are. The season includes 47 performances with the children divided into two alternating casts. Watching them in a late evening rehearsal on a school night, you can see the single-mindedness in their earnest little faces. I'm Marie in this year's Nutcracker, which is um, basically the main character who earns the Nutcracker and goes through all the acts. It's exciting and making me nervous at the same time. It takes so much devotion and you basically, your whole life is just dancing, but you know, I have a life too, but you know, <laughs> um, but that's, that's your favorite thing to do. Tell me about the Nutcracker. What will you be doing in the Nutcracker this year? I'll be Fritz, the brother of Marie, and he tries to get attention by being mean and doing things to her. Is that fun for you? Yeah, it's really <laughs> fun. What makes it fun? Usually I, I don't do that at home, but it's, it's kind of fun to be like a whole different person, even if you don't mean it. 
The School of American Ballet is the official school for the New York City Ballet, so just being accepted as a student is an honor. To then be chosen for the Nutcracker feels magical to these children, and the whimsy of the production allows them to both dance seriously and have serious fun. When I was little, I used to always go to the ballet, and I would always like look up at the dancers and I'd always be like, I want to be one of those dancers, and now I finally get to actually be one myself. I feel kind of nervous for all those people just like looking at me, even though I can't see the audience. Uh -huh. It just, that feeling makes me nervous, but at the same time, I get really excited. As a profession, ballet is intensely competitive, even for children as clearly talented as these. But what they learn here goes far beyond the world of dance. Not every kid in the Nutcracker, even the Lees, they might not be professional dancers. They might, but they might not. But what do they gain from this? They gain a tremendous amount of discipline, a focus, the skills are very translatable into real life, whether they become dancers or not. And for some of these young dancers, dreams actually do come true. The School of American Ballet says in the past five years, advanced students have gone on to join 35 U.S. ballet companies, including the New York City Ballet, and about a dozen international dance troops. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Arts in the City. I'm Pat Collins in the theater district where many popular stars are spending the holidays. Hugh Jackman is getting standing ovations for his performance in the river. Bradley Cooper returns to Broadway in The Elephant Man. And with more than 30 shows to choose from, there is something for everyone this season on The Great White Way. A revival of On the Town at the Lyric Theater celebrates the musical's 70th anniversary. Alan Cumming and the cabaret cast welcome Emma Stone, making her Broadway debut playing Sally Bowles. But do you think I got so much as even a mention in the program? I only created the lead it's one and only hit and no mention. The egos in this business. <laughs> that matchless comic genius Nathan Lane leaves It's Only a Play after the holidays. Martin Short takes over Nathan's role January 7th. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Kirby? <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm not very presentable. The cast of You Can't Take It With You, which includes James Earl Jones and Rose Byrne, provides non-stop hilarity at the Longacre Theater. Other revivals on Broadway include The Real Thing with Cynthia Nixon, Ewan McGregor, and Maggie Gyllenhaal, and the provocative 2013 Pulitzer Prize winning play, Disgraced. It's not a secret. Em and I don't see eye to eye on Islam. A coming of age story, the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime, received glowing reviews in London and on this side of the pond as well. Sideshow, which flopped on Broadway in 1997, returns for a second chance under the direction of Bill Condon. The musical is based on the true story of co-joined twins who worked the vaudeville circuit during the Depression. Tony winners Glenn Close and John Lithgow are setting box office records at the Golden Theater in a revival of Edward Albee's celebrated 1966 play, A Delicate Balance. There is limited ticket availability in December for two Disney musicals. The long-running hit The Lion King and the Tony-nominated Aladdin. Cinderella leaves the ball for the last time on January 3rd. That is the musical's closing date. When the, last ship sails, when the, the Last Ship, with an arresting score by Sting, offers discount tickets to all union members who present their union cards at the box office. You got to get Shows with performances on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve include Beautiful and the Tony-winning musicals A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder and Kinky Boots. Everybody say yeah, yeah, yeah.
There are three long-running musicals here on West 44th Street, The Phantom of the Opera, Mamma Mia, and Rock of Ages. And for clever children of all ages, Matilda is at the Schubert Theater. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. Enjoy getting holiday cards from family and friends? Then you'll love what the Morgan Library has planned this winter. Well, this is an exhibition of holiday cards that were made by a range of artists from most from the 20th century, but some still living. And they all come to us from the Smithsonian Archives of American Art in Washington, D.C. Christine Nelson, curator of literary and historical manuscripts, helped put the exhibit together. While the Smithsonian has hundreds of personal cards that were handmade by famous artists, the Morgan Library was able to borrow 57 of those cards for viewing. As you look around the room, what you see really are a lot of small-scale works of art that are wonderful to look at in their own right. But what's wonderful to me about them is that they're all evidence of relationships between people and how those people made connections during the holidays. At the Morgan Library and Museum, correspondence such as cards and letters are very important. The reason that we hold that kind of material is because it is evidence both of history but of relationships between people. So here we see a very particular, special kind of work that was sent from one person to another, sometimes from one artist to another, sometimes from an artist to a family member to commemorate the season. One example is artist Robert Indiana, whose card gave way to his now world-famous love sculpture. Probably almost everyone is familiar with Indiana's love sculpture, but what we have in the exhibition is the holiday card that really got that all started. So he made a rubbing that includes the letters L-O-V-E with the famous tilted O and sent that to a friend. And again, this is Dorothy Miller at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, she loved it and decided to ask him to create a card based on it for MoMA. And that all preceded the sculpture that is now you know, in, in various incarnations around the world. Spreading some holiday cheer from the Morgan Library. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson for Arts in the City. He's been called the Jewish Elvis, and even the Jewish Lady Gaga. But his fans know him as Lipa. Barry Mitchell has your all-access pass. Lipa Schmelzer is an international superstar who rocks the house. He also rocks the boat of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish establishment. If I do something wrong, then I'm a rebel. Instead of a rabbi, rebbe, I'm a rebel. We caught up with the perpetually overscheduled 36-year-old father of four, holding court and signing autographs at the Hillel Craft Center for Jewish Student Life at Columbia University, where he's a part-time student. Lipa Schmelzer, this is our December show, so let's talk about your video, Believe in a Miracle. Hanukkah is a beautiful Yom Tov, a beautiful holiday that appeals to everybody. There are a lot of areas in Judaism where we have strong segregation. Lipa was raised in ultra-Orthodox Haredi Judaism, in which women are kept segregated from men. I never had a woman in my video before. I said, you know what? The women also have a right to celebrate Hanukkah. And the open-minded, modern, Orthodox, good Jews, in their worlds, I don't think that women are second-class citizens. Growing up in the insular Hasidic town of New Square, New York, Lipa's parents did not allow him to listen to secular music. Up until the age of 20, my influences were only Jewish music, so I started to work in a butcher shop and I delivered chicken. And in the privacy of his delivery van, Lipa started listening to Top 40. So I had to put on the radio, and it was, in a sense, like, ugh, I can't the guilt and it's not for me and the style. But Lipa began to find value in pop tunes. I think it was E100. I turn to you like a flower leading towards the sun. I turn to you cause you're the only one. 
and I and I took that song and, and spoke to, to Hashem, to God. I turned to you because you're the only one. And I said, wow, I wish I can bring this style in to Jewish people and lift them up a little bit. So in that case, I think it's a mitzvah, it's a good deed to bring in a good piece of pop. <laughs> And I bring them in kosher music. What's kosher music? It's an ingredient that I don't talk about love relationships. I don't talk about guns and killing. But I'm giving them a good beat to enjoy themselves. Tell us about your town hall concert. It was the first time I made a theatrical show. I called it Leap on Broadway. <laughs> I did it for a one-day show, filled up the place. It was one big therapy session. <laughs> for who? For them or you? For me, mainly. 33 rabbis got together a few years ago and denounced your participation in a big Madison Square Garden charity show. They banned this show and I backed out and for one year I played, I laid low. But then after a year I came like a spring, like a slingshot and I came, boo! Excuse me, does this include batteries? Sorry, batteries not included. There's no rules about music. But because it didn't exist many years ago, so it's something new. Everything that's a little bit new, they're very much afraid of. I'm not ultra-Orthodox Haredi. I'm a good Orthodox Jew, and that's following the laws with an updated taste of the world where God put me in. I live in America and I have to behave like an American good citizen, still follow within the boundaries of the Judaism I was brought up. But within my boundaries, I want to have the good of the Judaism part and the good of the world. Singer, songwriter, Hasidic superstar, Lipa Schmelzer has recorded over a dozen albums. Find them on iTunes, Amazon.com and GoLipa.com. I believe in a miracle. miracle. Who believes in a miracle? miracle. We believe in a miracle. miracle. Yeah. Barry Mitchell for Arts in the City. For more of Barry's interview and all our stories, you can log on to CUNY.tv. That's our show for today. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and we'll see you next month on Arts in the City.